Welcome to everybody who's on Zoom. Welcome to everybody who's on Facebook. And if anybody else found another way to be with us this morning, there's some folks in our sanctuary this morning. And so we have a bit of a hybrid uh, situation going on here. We're a little new to that. And um, so anyway, we are, we'll plug on through and hopefully uh, we've practiced enough that we can make this a smooth morning. Um, I'm Julia Hicks. I'm the Director of Mission here at First Congregational Church. We are a just peace, an open and affirming, an anti-racist church. And there are um, extended statements that you can find in the website, firstcongo.com. And I would uh, recommend that everybody read those statements to understand more about who we are what our motivations are in our programs and ministries. And I want to say a special welcome to those of you that are newcomers. And it's hard to tell who you are right now. And so we ask you to come forward and make yourself uh, known to us. And we love using the chat feature on Zoom, for those of you that are on Zoom, to just speak up on chat and say uh, who you are, that you are new today. You might tell us where you're coming from because some people are from out of town. Uh, this is an unusual time to try to get to know people and to find a church. So we just reach out with a little bit of extra effort to do that. You can also go to the website and you can go to, to the website, which is firstcongo.com and then backslash connect and that will send you to a form that you can fill out and let us know more information about yourself and um, the staff of the church will receive that and we can connect back with you and so we'll have a little bit more announcements later in the service uh, but for now it's good we're here together Please join in and as we sing our first hymn.
good morning, First Congo. My name is Sandra Summers, and I am a, a UCC ordained clergy who lives here in Memphis, Tennessee. Um, I'm grateful to, for the invitation to be reading our scripture this morning, assisted by my 14 month old. So we'll see how this goes. Um, so this morning's reading comes from, oh, you want to help? Come help. Um, okay. This morning's reading comes from Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 12, verses 1 through 5. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living <laughs> sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds so that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you not to think of yourself more highly than you ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body, we have many members, and not all members have the same function. So we who are many are one body in Christ. Individually, we are members of one another. May God add to our understandings of these portions of Holy Scripture this morning. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, First Congo. Good morning, children. I'm going to, I'm Juan, and I'm going to do the children's sermon today. We haven't been together with me as doing the children's sermon in a while, so I'm happy to be back. So the word from uh, the Bible reading today somewhat talks about how we present ourselves to God. So I came up with the idea, what if we how would you describe yourself to God in one word? Some ideas. Are you a son? Or maybe you're a sister? A brother? A daughter? Or maybe you're friendly? Maybe you're and an adventurer. Are you happy? Funny? Or maybe you might describe yourself as an athlete. Or I like this one, a dreamer. Are you an artist? Like to draw and paint and make things? I see some people responding where nowadays we have those fun games on our, our phones and things, so you might be a gamer. For those of us who are more introspective, which is me too, a reader. But then I also think there's some other ways that we can describe ourselves in one word. Some of us are pink. Some of us are tall. Some of us are brown, tan, but then I thought, what are some of the most important ways you could describe yourself in one word? How about peacemaker? Or for one of us, for us in First Congo, maybe one that might be really important, those who believe in Jesus, Son of God, Christian. So go out within this week and think about, oh, oh, I forgot. Can you also be a son and a peacemaker? Yes. Can you be brown and a Christian? Yes. So even though we can describe ourselves in one word, we also could be also a multitude. But think about the ones that are most important to you and how you present yourself to God, such as like peacemaker and a Christian and a friend. And that's all. That's the word of God.
we now come to a very special and exciting part of our worship service in which we will baptize our dear Zaley Yoder. Want to stand right here? Thank you. Hi. Saint Philip writes that in baptism we know faith as our earth in which we take root, hope as the water in which we are nourished, love as the air through which we grow, truth as the light through which we become fully grown. St. Paul writes that in baptism, we know ourselves through the eyes, the compassion, and the grace of God. We know ourselves as beloved, as connected with God, all humanity, and the earth itself. There is no longer Jew or Greek. There is no longer slave or free. There is no longer male and female. We are one in Jesus Christ. In the tradition of the early church, we learn that holy wisdom, God's partner in creation, yearns to make all things new by revealing to us our connection with God, the source of all life, joy, and love. In the Gospels, we learn that Jesus, who was baptized by John in the River Jordan, taught that all people should turn and accept the God who had already accepted them and named them as beloved. Today, we, the members and friends of First Congregational United Church of Christ, proclaim that same message, that God, who has claimed each of us as a beloved child of God, will speak again today for Zaley as a beloved daughter. This sacrament of baptism is an outward and visible sign of an internal and eternal form of grace the naming of a love which is our birthright as beings created by the breath of God. Let us pray. Eternal God, we thank you for the gift of life, for the truth that each of us rests in your care and cannot find a place outside the circle of your love. Before the world had shaped and formed, you were goodness and life. Out of the waters of the deep, you called forth the firmament and created the earth to sustain all life. We ask, O oh God, that you pour out your holy presence in this water so that it may nurture, sustain, wash, and renew all who are touched by it, and that it may create new life and an understanding of your love within this child so that she may be alive and reborn in the joy of your love, you the one who was, who is, and who always shall be. Amen. And now I have some questions for Zaley's parents. Do you desire to have this child baptized as a beloved child of God into the care of the community of faith, the community of those who know themselves as beloved of God? If so, please say, we do. We do. Will you teach her, her to follow in the way of Jesus and to seek the renewing power of Christ? If so, please say, we will. Will you teach her to renounce the powers of evil and seek the freedom of new life in the spirit? If so, please say, we will. Will you teach her to resist oppression and show love and justice as a witness of God's love for the whole human family? As best you are able. If so, please say, we will. Yeah. Will you encourage her to participate in the life and mission of God's people who seek to serve one another and all children of the world? If so, please say, we will. We will. By what name shall this child be called? Zaley McKenna. Zaley McKenna. You are baptized in the name of God, our Creator, Jesus, our companion, and the Holy Spirit, our strength. Zaley, the Holy Spirit is upon you. You are a beloved child of God, with whom God is well pleased, in whom God's Spirit lives. 
Omi and Andrew, may you be renewed in the strength of your baptismal promises and vows as well. Parents and family of dear little Zaley, we invite you to join your voices in a prayer to affirm your new commitment. We now invite the congregation of our church to share its commitment to Zaley and her whole family. We give Zaley the gift of tradition and the gift of faith, a heritage of strength and courage, of the love of wisdom and the love of all humanity. Zaley is named by a love which has been passed down from generation to generation and which is received newly within each life. May we always help her remember this holy love from which she was born and raised. Amen. Back over to our Oh my, oh my, that was really special. Now I've got to um, check my notes because I'm so involved in my emotions of, of getting to see the Yoder family. And um, let's see, have I, am I unmuted? Yes, I am. Um, my computer's telling me things, so let me make sure I'm correct. All right, you can hear me, Juan. Could you give me a thumbs up? Okay, thank you so much. Um, beautiful to see that family. That's one of the most special things that can happen in the life of a church, and so we're just we're just so pleased to get to enjoy that even virtually this morning. All right, well, let me say a couple of other things that are special in the life of the church. One is I want to let everybody know that our senior pastor, Cheryl Cornish, I have spoken to her this week. She's recovering well. She's uh, on the second cycle of sisters. Her sister Eileen left yesterday after being with her for the first week after she's had her hip replacement surgery. And her sister Mary is in town now to help Mark um, with loving her and caring for her. And so she's feeling good and she's already able to tell very well that that new hip is going to feel a whole lot better than the old hip and so anyway we continue our prayers to Cheryl and our love as well and you may remember those of you that were worshiping with us last Sunday that we kept making announcements about the pending birth of Colin Ezekiel Curry that's the new baby of our music our director of music um, Alicia, uh, Alicia Garcia Curry and and uh, yes, indeed, he was born right after church. And you may have seen in the Congo Beat a photograph of him with his father, Chris. Um, we'll follow up with more photographs and everything. We've heard from her. She feels good. Everybody's well. The children are excited. Just wanted to let you know a follow up on that. Um, I also want to let you know that we did something for the very first time yesterday, and it was a wonderful success. We had the um, 
Shelby County Health Department came to our sanctuary, like over 30 people, um, and they they did a vaccination, a COVID vaccination event in our sanctuary. And this was co-hosted by the Cooper Young Community Farmers Market and, of course, First Congregational Church. We had a few volunteers there, but frankly, those professionals knew what they were doing so well that, for the most part, they just sort of took over our sanctuary, got it set up and 50 people received their vaccinations and their boosters yesterday which was their goal that's in two hours and so that was that was a steady flow of people coming through and getting their vaccines and and so we were thrilled with that and I will also tell you that the folks from the health department just couldn't say often enough how special it felt to be in our bright and warm and beautiful sanctuary, to be in a sacred space at the same time that they felt like everybody felt like they were doing a sacred thing. And um, so anyway, they're hoping that we'll be able to do that again. We'll be looking into that. And I just want you to feel good about that. And then one quick story is that at the very, very end, um, they had two vaccines left and they don't like to waste a drop. And so they went out to the farmer's market and they just started shouting around. We got two vaccines left. We want somebody to use them. And sure enough, uh, two people came in and the whole group just applauded because not there was, there was not a drop spilled and um, 50 people total got vaccinated. Let's see, I also want to let you know that our plan, if you've been looking at your announcements, is that our virtual worship will continue uh, for several more weeks through the 13th of February. We have very good reason, as we're paying attention as you are, to all the, the reports and stuff. We really feel hopeful that the 20th of February we'll be able to reopen the sanctuary uh, for worship and while we continue to do it virtually as well for those people that are, are not in town. Um, let's see, uh, an important announcement for those of you that enjoy and those of you who have never been with us for our Congo Connect events. These events are a wonderful opportunity for making new friends and for taking existing friendships and deepening them, enjoying them more fully. Because we, we are, there's a trained group of us in the sanctuary that have learned some of the techniques of authentic relating. And so it's six o'clock on Friday night. There's a Zoom that will be in the Congo Beat and also in the um, uh, uh, the the website. And you come on at six o'clock. It lasts about an hour and a half, and we will guide you through some opportunities and um, of connecting with each other in ways that tell our stories, that share our experiences, that help us meet each other, get to know each other. So if you have been there before. I feel confident that you'll be there if you can. And those of you that haven't been there before, I truly invite you to come and, and enjoy this experience and try it out yourself. I also want to say that the, the mom of Zay Lee was one of our trained folks. She now lives in Florida, of course, but that relationship is so authentic. We don't let go of her. And uh, so it tickled me to see her this morning because we are, we are so close with her through this authentic relating. Um, let's see, um, you saw where Lillian posted our announcements on the screen before worship. Those same announcements are in the website. They are also in the Congo Beat. And so I urge you that if you want to keep up, you got to go to one of those places and check out all those announcements. And let me look very carefully and make sure I haven't forgotten anything. I don't think so. So let's return to our worship with our morning anthem. Sometimes all you need to see the goodness that's around you is some brand new eyes. So I thought it was important to uh, chronicleize that and put it in song. So I'll play it for you right now.
took me so long to see what right instead of what wrong. You want to know why? Didn't have my brand new eye. So if you want, you need some peace of mind. I wish you hear these words I'd buy. Sitting on your mind, it ain't no lie. I got my brand new eye, and every life gonna come some wrong. You keep on stepping, you travel on. It ain't no lie. I got my brand new eye. Good morning, friends. Thank you, Doug McLeod, wherever you are, for that wonderful offering. For those of you who are just joining our service online, my name is Tony Coleman, and I serve as one of First Congo's associate pastors. This morning, I want to invite you to consider with me the question, the topic, the experience of identity. Let me start then with a question. Who do you say that you are. Think about that for just a minute. If you were to start telling a stranger who you were, what details would you be sure not to leave out? What details would you start with? Let me ask another question. If I were to ask your voting ballot who you were, what might the answer be? And then what if I asked your bank account 
what preferences and proclivities, what causes or commitments, what trends or hobbies might one discover are a part of you? Would you reveal yourself to be a faith and flag conservative or an iPhone devotee? Would one find that you are a Walmart goer or an establishment liberal? Would it be clear that you are a democratic mainstay or a Trader Joe's Republican, a Target customer or a local news reader or a Kroger shopper or an Amazon user? Just who are you? Some of the labels I used just now may not have been ones you've heard before, but trust, someone somewhere has almost certainly used one of them to describe you. Even though we only have elections every few years, pollsters and political electioneers are constantly researching their targets, us. They call us at home or pull us on the street. They send surveys through the mail or over the internet. They watch where we move to and where we get our groceries from. They create thousands of data points about each one of us. And then they sort. They categorize and they label. They put us into increasingly specific boxes that don't just try to describe what we believe. These boxes try to capture who we are. Soccer moms, committed conservatives, die-hard liberal Democrats, people who watch certain kinds of news, shop in certain kinds of places, live in certain kinds of ways. Then, then in addition to the pollsters and the super PACs and the think tanks, then there are the corporate marketers. They do all that same kind of research and then some looking at our internet usage and media consumption. They track what websites we visit, what links we click, how long we watch an Instagram post. They take that data and they too sort it and categorize it and box us up into various types of potential customers. Long gone are the simpler, cruder days of sorting people according only to race, class, gender, age, and so on. Nowadays, the technology and the techniques of marketing have gotten so sophisticated that who you are, your identity according to the research, is about so much more than accidents of birth or circumstance. Nowadays, the marketers know what makes you tick, what makes you happy or angry, what makes you afraid or aroused. They take that information and they select ads and information to put in front of you, specially designed and expertly crafted messages just for you. And what do all those messages say? Well, pretty much all of them. No matter where you see them or where they're from are simply this. You and your life would be so much better if only. If only. If only you voted this way or bought this thing. If only you gave your support to this cause or your money to this company. If only you did what we're telling you to do, you'd be better off. You'd be safer. You'd be great again. You'd be happier or slimmer, younger or richer. You'd be more of what you want and less of what you don't. Who you are, your identity could radically improve if only. The strategy then is basically this. Look at what people do with their time and their money sort them into a box based on those preferences, and then convince them to jump into a line to vote or to purchase like their lives depend on it. Boxes and lines. These are the shapes of modern society, and, these are, and there are forces from every direction pressuring us to conform. If we put the political typologies aside, though, 
If we set down the trends and peeked at the faces behind the latest version of the iPhone, if we peeled back the layers of usernames and Twitter handles and looked beyond the ideological trenches, whom would we find? If not boxes and lines, what is the shape of you? Paul writes in this morning's scripture reading, Be not conformed to this world, but rather be transformed. When we break down that word, when we break down that word conform, we get the Latin prefix con, meaning together, and then the verb form, meaning to shape, to shape together, to be in the same form as conform. On the other hand, the word transform means to be, in fact, beyond shape, to be beyond, to supersede form altogether. In other words, according to Paul, the shape that the world gives us for understanding who we are, those boxes and those lines are not only ill-equipped to contain us, they don't even come close to holding everything that we could be. Rather conformed, we are to be transformed. We are to be, Paul tells us, beyond boxes and lines and shapes of any sort. This is because, friends, as our faith is concerned, we do not find our identity in a pole or a survey, not in a test or a series of web searches, not in a census or a profile. We find our identity in God, in a mystery. Let's be clear, though. God isn't a mystery because God is unknowable at every level. There is plenty that we can and do know about God. We know, for instance, that God is love. We know that God blesses the meek and puts the last first. We know that God can bring the mountains low and make the crooked places straight. We know that there is no kind of death which God cannot overcome. We know something about God. But as soon as we think we've got God pinned, as soon as we think we've got God figured out, understood, boxed in, it's just at that point that God shows us that she's so much more than what we thought. God is a mystery because he has endless potential, unending ability. God is a mystery because God never stops, is always in the process of being and becoming. That is the image after which we are made, friends. That is the blueprint for our identity. That endless being and that forever becoming, that is inside us. That's the reason pollsters and marketers have to do so much work to shove us into boxes and convince us to put ourselves in lines. That's why there's a whole sector of our job market that is devoted to researching and messaging to us. Our truest identity, the identity we find in the mystery that is God, that cannot be easily advertised to. That is bigger than specially designed messaging. And so the politicians promise and the products guarantee that they can change and improve us. They try to convince us, in fact, that we can't without them. They suggest we should conform because we would be less, would always fa fall short of our best selves if we didn't. However, at the heart of the life transformed, the identity we live out with God, there lies a fundamental truth. We always have the potential to surprise even ourselves with what we can do. We can grow and deepen. We can expand and enlarge because that's what mysteries do. That's what God does. 
The thing about it is, though, this transformation doesn't just happen. It is achieved. To be transformed in the ways Paul names, to return to the truth that we are bigger than boxes and lines, we have to do some work. We have to, Paul tells us, renew our minds. In a world like ours, a world in which our Google searches are conditioned according to what we've clicked on in the past, a world in which Amazon tailors even its book recommendations based on what you've already purchased, in a world where the powers that be are creating literal echo chambers all around us, creating big boxes where the information and the choices we're given are different versions of what we've already done. In this kind of world, we have to work to remember and to affirm that we are so much bigger than a box. We have to work to remember and affirm that our identity is grounded in God. And that means we can do, we can be almost anything. We have to read things we're not expected to read. We have to befriend people we're not expected to befriend. We have to go places that are off our beaten path and join up with the people we're least expected to meet. We have to give away rather than throw away. We have to make our purchases based on our needs rather than the wants somebody else has manufactured for us. We have to be, in other words, who we really already are, a mystery unable to be boxed in, unable to be lined up. We have to work to let God be our center, our source. And remember that our potential cannot be contained, not in a box, not in a line, or in anything else. May it be so, and amen. We now worship God as we present our offerings.
As is our weekly ritual, will you please join with me in reading our affirmation of community? We will be together. We will stand as brothers and sisters given life by one God. We will be together. We will watch out for one another. We will listen to what needs to be said in a spirit of compassion. We will respect the power of silence. We will wait for the slowest. We will sooner or later catch up with the fastest. We will dry the tears of those who are weeping and know that they will dry ours when the time comes. We will let ourselves begin to feel at least a little of the pain of those we have considered our enemies. We will entrust our stories to each other. We will not be skeptical that peace can come. We will not forget the joy of life. We will not forget to be grateful. We will do our best to stir in each other hope, courage, and faith. Won't you pray with me? Gracious God, our God who knows us, who shapes us, who sees us, and who guides us, we turn our minds to you and open our hearts to one another in this time of prayer. As we worship, even while still mostly physically outside of this sanctuary, Remind us that our praise rises to you, no matter where we are. And we join the timeless rhythms and ageless melodies and the everlasting joyful noise that permeates all of your creation. God of all life, we pray for the needs of each person gathered in your name today. There are some who are confronting physical challenges, big and small. We pray for the continued rest and recovery of our beloved Pastor Cheryl as she is rehabilitating from her successful hip replacement. We pray for baby Alma June, granddaughter of our Julia Hicks, who has faced some setbacks this week and will undergo surgery soon. Bless and strengthen her little body. We pray for Mike Robertson's mother as she recovers from an illness. We pray for the many in our congregation and in our community who continue to battle COVID-19, including Carol Stockton. We pray for all of these individuals and for their caregivers. We know that caregiving sometimes feels like a privilege, but can also be exhausting. We also pray for teachers and parents as they continue to navigate life and learning for their children in the midst of a pandemic that will not quickly end. We pray for those who lack secure housing, especially as the winter cold has set in we pray for those who lack food security. May this community continue to join with others across this city and across this nation to fill in those gaps so that no one goes to bed hungry. God, as we face the ongoing challenges of the day, all of our personal challenges and all of the isms we continue to see, we pray for your touch to encourage and uplift us in all the ways that we need you. Every day we are confronted with the uncertainty and suffering in the world around us, and it is tempting at times to succumb to compassion fatigue. But you have given us hearts to empathize, and so our prayers encircle our neighbors, both known and unknown. And God, let us never forget, as we say in our affirmation of community, never forget the joy and to offer thanks for the gifts we receive each and every day, for new life, for Colin Ezekiel Curry and Parker Jared Holt Grew, for new baptisms like sweet Zaley Yoder, 
for new members like Melody Derniker. These are just some of the joys experienced in this community. Help us to see them, to name them, and to feel them fully. We need these moments. God of all compassion, we know that there is nothing that can separate us from your love. Seasons will pass, times will change, but your faithfulness towards us is constant always. As we meet the challenges of the week ahead, help us to rest deeply in that knowledge. Transform our lives more and more to reflect the peace, joy, and strength that we know as your followers. And now we pray together in the words you taught us to pray. Let us read together the covenant prayer. We covenant with the Lord and one with another and do bind ourselves in the presence of God to walk together in all his ways according as he is pleased to reveal himself unto us in his blessed word of truth. Amen. Friends, let us go forth into the rest of this week knowing that we are transformed, called to be so much more than a box, so much bigger than a line. Amen. Let's join together in singing our final hymn.
Hello, you can unmute now. Start yakking with each other. Alondra, can you say hi? Hi, Alondra. <laughs> hi. Good to see you, Katie. Hi. 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 Everybody. Uh, yes, hello, Alondra. <laughs> hi, hi, mommy and daddy. Hi, Tony. <laughs> Tony. Yeah. Hi, yeah. nice, sweetie. <laughs> you can laugh and you can laugh and laugh. Hey, Alondra. Oh, that's me. That's alive, too. Mm -hmm. That's Millie. <laughs> You're looking for Muley? For Muley. <laughs> yeah, she asks about Muley every time. <laughs> what else is church? Smart girl. Smart. Oh, that's funny. Have fun Love this you. week. <laughs> Thank you. Have a great week, everybody. They already did. <laughs> yes, do please. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye, Alondra. <laughs> <I'm kidding. laughs> Hi, everybody. It's Katie Mussolino. Hey, how are you? Hey, hey. 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 Good to see you. Good to see you, Katie. My my sister and sister in law are taking such good care of me. Oh. Daughter. Oh, that's daughter. Daughter. <laughs> daughter and daughter in law. <laughs> yeah. Daughter. Thank you. <laughs> Good. Hey, Julia, so you, can, uh, you, you can stop recording. Oh, I'll do that. That's. <laughs> <laughs>